Chapter 8 of Tom Swift and His Motorcycle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Wayne Cook. Tom Swift and His Motorcycle by Victor Appleton. Chapter 8 Suspicious Actions. Are you hurt? asked tom as he leaned his motorcycle against the fence and stood beside the negro hurt repeated the darky i's killed that's what i is i ain't got a whole bone in my body good landy but i'm sitting in an awful state would you mind tell me if that damn you still alive of course he is answered tom he isn't hurt a bit but why can't you turn around and look for yourself no sir no indeedy sir replied the colored man you don't guess this here nigger looking round why not why not cause i tell you why not i'm so stiff and i so nearly broke to pieces that if i turn my head round i sure will twist off in my body no sir no indeedy sir i ain't going to turn round but i am you sure that my mule boomerang ain't hurted no he's not hurt a bit and i'm sure you are not i didn't strike you that hard for I must had stopped my machine. Try to get up. I'm positive you'll find yourself all right. I'm sorry it happened. Oh, that's all right. Don't mind me, went on the colored man. It was my fault for getting in the road. But that mule boomerang am certainly the most outrageous quadruped that ever circumlocuted. Why do you call him boomerang? asked Tom, wondering if the negro was really hurt. For what I call him boomerang? Did you ever see them Australian black men so it goes around with the circus to throw them crooked sticks they call boomerangs? Yes, I've seen them. Well, boomerang, my mule, is just like that. He's crooked to begin with, and another thing, you can never tell where you start him where he's going to twine land up. That's why I call him boomerang. I see. <laughs> it's a very proper name. But why don't you get up? Do you think I can? Sure, try it. Uh, by the way, what's your name? My name? Why, I was christened Eradicate Andrew Jackson Abraham Lincoln Sampson. But most folks generally call me Eradicate Simpson. And some don't even go to that length. They just call me Rad for show. Eradicate, mused Tom. That's a queer name, too. Why were you called that? <laughs> well, you see, uh, I eradicate the dirt. I'm a cleaner with a whitewasher by profession, and somebody give me that name. They say it was fitting and proper, and I kept it ever since. Yes, sir, I's Eradicate Simpson at your service. You ain't got no chicken coop you want cleaned out, has you? Oh, any stables or fences to whitewash? I guarantee satisfaction. Well, I might find some work for you to do replied the young inventor, thinking this would be as good a means as any of placating the darky. But come now, try and see if you can't stand. I don't believe I broke any of your legs. Uh, I guess now. You feel better now. Where am that work you was a-speaking of, said Eradicate Samson. Now that there seemed to be a prospect of earning money, rose quickly and easily. Why, you're all right exclaimed Tom, glad to find that the accident had had no serious consequences. Yes, sir, I guess I be. Where did you say you had some uh, whitewashing to do? No place in particular, but there is always something that needs doing around our house. If you call, I'll give you a job. Yes, sir, I'll be sure to call. And Eradicate walked back to where Boomerang was patiently waiting. Tom told the colored man how to find the swift home, and was debating with himself whether he ought not to offer Radicate some money as compensation for knocking him into the air, when he noticed that the negro was tying one wheel of his wagon fast to the body of the vehicle with a rope. "'What are you doing that for?' asked Tom. "'Got to, to get down to here with this load of fence posts,' was the answer. "'If I didn't, it would be right on the heels of Boomerang, and whenever he peels anything on his heels, he does act worse than a circus mule. But why don't you use your brake? I see you have one on the wagon. Use the brake to hold back going downhill. Excuse me, Mr. Swift, excuse me, exclaimed Eradicate quickly, but uh, you don't know that uh, brake. It's worse than none at all. 
It don't work for a fat. No, indeedy, sir. I's got to rope de wheel. Tom was interested at once. He made an examination of the brake, and soon saw why it would not hold the wheels. The foot lever was not properly connected with the brake bar. It was a simple matter to adjust it by changing a single bolt, and this Tom did with tools he took from the bag on his motorcycle. The colored man looked on in open-mouthed amazement, and even Boomerang peered lazily around as if taking an interest in the proceedings. There, said Tom at length, as he tightened the nut, that brake will work now and hold the wagon on any hill. You won't need to rope the wheel. You didn't have the right leverage on it. Excuse me, Mr. Swift, uh, but what's that you said? And Redicate leaned forward to listen deferentially. I said you didn't have the right leverage. No, sir, Mr. Swift, excuse me, uh, but you made a slight mistake. I ain't never had no leverage on this wagon. It ain't that kind of wagon. I once drove a livery wig, but, but that was uh, some years ago. I ain't worked for the livery stable in some time now, that's why. I know there ain't no livery in this wagon. You'll excuse me, but uh, you am slightly mistaken. <laughs> All right, rejoined Tom with a laugh, not thinking it was worth while to explain what he meant by the lever force of the brake rod. Let it go at that. Livery or no livery, your brake will work now. I guess you're all right. Now, don't forget to come around and do some whitewashing. And seeing that the colored man was able to mount to the seat and start off Boomerang, who seemed to have deep-rooted objections about moving, Tom wheeled his motorcycle back to the road. Eradicate Simpson drove his wagon a short distance, then suddenly applied the brake. It stopped short, and the mule looked around as if surprised. It sure do work, Master Swift, called the darky to Tom, who was waiting the result of his little repair job. It sure do work. I'm glad of it. My golly, but you am certainly a conjure man when it come to digs and wagons. Did you ever work for the blacksmith? No, not exactly. Well, goodbye, Eradicate. I'll look for you some day next week. With that, Tom leaped on his machine and speeded off ahead of the colored man in his rig. As he passed the low defense posts, the youth heard Eradicate remark in awe-stricken tones, "'My golly, he certainly do like the wind, and to think that I were hit by that monstrousness machine and not hurt it. My golly, things is um, certainly happening. Glang, bummerang!' "'This machine has more possibilities in it than I suspected,' mused Tom." But one thing I've got to change, and that is the gasoline and spark controls. I don't like them the way they are. I want a better leverage, just as Eradicate needed on his wagon. I'll fix them, too, when I get home. He rode for several hours until he thought it was about dinner time, and then, heading the machine toward home, he put on all the speed possible, soon arriving where his father was at work in his shop. Well, how goes it? asked Mr. Swift, with a smile, as he looked at the flushed face of his son. Fine, Dad. I scooted along in great shape, and had an adventure, too. You didn't meet any more of those men, did you? The men who were trying to get my invention? asked Mr. Swift, apprehensively. No, indeed, Dad. I simply had a little run-in with a chap named Eradicate Andrew Jackson Abraham Lincoln Sampson, otherwise known as Rad Sampson and I engaged him to do some whitewashing for us. We do need some whitewashing done, don't we, Dad? What's that? asked Mr. Swift, thinking his son was joking. Then Tom told him of the happening. Yes, I think I can find some work for Eradicate to do, went on Mr. Swift. There is some dirt in the boiler shop that needs eradicating, and I think he can do it. But dinner has been waiting some time. We'll go in now, or Mrs. Bagger will be out after us. Father and son were soon at the table, and Tom was explaining what he meant to do to improve his motorcycle. His father offered some suggestions regarding the placing of the gasoline lever. I'd put it up here, he said, and with his pencil began to draw a diagram on the white tablecloth. My goodness, Mr. Swift, exclaimed Mrs. Baggard, whatever are you doing? And she sprang up in some alarm. Uh, what's the matter? Did I upset my tea? asked the inventor innocently. No, but you are soiling the tablecloth. Pencil marks are so hard to get out. Take a piece of paper, please. Oh, is that all? rejoined Mr. Swift with a smile. Well, Tom, here is the way I would do that. 
and substituting the back of an envelope for the tablecloth, he continued drawing. Tom was looking over his father's shoulder interestedly when Mrs. Baggert, who was taking off some of the dinner dishes, suddenly asked, "'Are you expecting a visitor, Mr. Swift?' "'A visitor? No. Why?' the inventor asked quickly. "'Because I just saw a man going into the machine shop,' went on the housekeeper. "'A man in the machine shop!' exclaimed Tom, rising from his chair. Mr. Swift also got up, and the two hurried from the house. As they reached the yard, they saw a man emerging from the building where Mr. Swift was constructing his turbine motor. The man had his back turned toward them and seemed to be sneaking around, as though desirous of escaping observation. "'What do you want?' called Mr. Swift. The man turned quickly. At the sight of Mr. Swift and Tom, he made a jump to one side and got behind a big packing box. "'That's queer,' spoke Tom. "'I wonder what he wants.' "'I'll soon see,' rejoined Mr. Swift, and he started on a run toward where the man was hiding. Tom followed his father, and as the two inventors reached the box, the man sprang from behind it and down the yard to a lane that passed in back of the Swift house. As he ran, he was seen to stuff some papers in his pocket. "'My plans! He's stolen some of my plans!' cried Mr. Swift. "'Catch him, Tom!' Tom ran after the stranger, whose curious actions had roused their suspicions, while Mr. Swift entered the motor shop to ascertain whether anything had been stolen. End of chapter 8